Oh my goodness, it has been a long time since I've gotten to talk to you folks. There's been just so much going on. I've been running two campaigns for a little while, but that's done, and there's a break coming up now, so the players have gotten themselves into kind of an interesting situation. A lot of cool stuff has gone on, so I want to make a video to let you folks know what has happened in my campaign over the last few sessions. Uh, there's definitely some stuff to talk about, and this is the video we're going to do it. So if you're not interested in a giant video with me talking about all the stuff that's happened in my campaign, that's totally fine. I'll try to throw in some lessons and things that I've done or interesting things I've learned, but it might just be a really long video with me talking about all the stuff that's happened in my game. So if you're not interested, sorry, maybe put this on in the background or something while you're washing dishes or playing Red Dead Redemption 2 or I don't know. Anyways, let's jump into the video. When last we left our heroes, goodness gracious, what, what did happen when last we left our heroes? It's been a hot minute. Right. We were in the middle of side quests and solo adventures, and I had sort of given one example of what had happened in one solo adventure and sort of stopped from there. But uh, let's go ahead and get everybody caught up on what happened with the other two solo side quest adventures between Sorel, played by Walter, and Azarin, played by Evelyn. So first, Azarin's story was uh, I mean, very dramatic, very interesting, but not necessarily that consequential to what is happening in the main game right now. Azarin is currently seeking the artifacts of Adara, her demigoddess. Uh, so there's different items that she's out and she's trying to find them. She was looking for the hammer, the hammer of Adara. And she knew that this uh, fire giant had it, and so she went to find this fire giant, this craftsman fire giant, and talked to him about, hey, could I have the hammer, and why would you let me have that, please? So she did some back and forth, and in that back and forth, in that travel, she found out where Thomas's aunt and uncle lived. Now, Thomas was a little boy that they had saved, and Azarin had gotten very attached as a sort of a mother or aunt figure to Thomas, and she found out where Thomas lived. It was sort of a test for her character to see, what are you going to do? Do you think you would be a better mother to Thomas than his aunt and uncle? You know, you're off trying to save the world. Uh, and to her credit, she definitely went back and got Thomas and brought him here. And it was a really cute emotional scene saying goodbye and all this stuff. And um, checking in from, from time to time with Thomas and his family has been uh, adorable and wonderful. And so that was a neat character moment that has happened for her. But she went to the fire giant, the master craftsman who makes these magic items with this dope hammer. And she was like, hey, can I have it? And he was like, yeah, sure, take it. She was like, is that for, for real? That's it? Oh, okay. Uh, and what followed was sort of reminiscent of this. Be right back. Are you even pulling? Are you on my team? Just represent, pull. All right, let's go. Yeah, I just sort of slapped a are you worthy um, qualifier onto the hammer, and it was a very interesting moment. She went up and she tried to pick up the hammer, and nothing happened, and he was like, oh, I just wanted to see what happened. Nobody's ever you know, been able to pick the hammer up except for me, and even sometimes I can't pick it up. Uh, and so that was kind of neat teaching her about, you know, being worthy and how do you become worthy and all of this and uh, it was sort of a, a test for her character. Are you willing to put the needs of others before your own quest? And um, he said, hey, you know, you taking this would mean that I don't get to craft these items, magical items and powerful artifacts for the people of Haven anymore. You would need to replace this hammer for me before I could give it to you. And so he told her where to find materials to go and uh, get that that hammer and it's in the nine hells and so she definitely traveled to the plain of Gehenna and had to get a blood ore or something from a meteorite in hell it was a whole crazy thing um, she had to fight off a blood demon it was pretty awesome uh, but anyways she comes back she helps him forge a replacement hammer and now she has the hammer of Adara those are the major things that happened in Azarin's uh, solo side quest her hammer might at some point reject her uh, depending on if she is worthy or not and she has given Thomas over to uh, to his aunt and uncle to maybe have a happy normal well adjusted ish life now Sorel has had a lot of stuff go on in his solo side quest that has come up again in the main game so a lot of things happening so obviously for those who maybe aren't quite 
brushed up on it. Sorrel used to be a warlock. He was following this patron, didn't really know who he was, but sort of doing stuff for this patron, and eventually started the process of awakening his patron, who turned out to be an undead titan. And the titans are crazy in my setting. They were the things that uh, were walking around when the gods were created by whatever created the gods. And the gods couldn't defeat the titans on their own. They had to team up with each other to go and defeat the titans, which actually, ironically, is the short adventure I was running for a different group. They were all playing the gods in the prehistory of my world, teaming up to go and defeat titans. It was pretty neat. Uh, but anyways, that is what uh, Sorel has been up to. And when this undead titan said, hey, it's time to cash in, get ultimate power, join me, help free me, and uh, you have ultimate power, basically. And Sorel said no. And so Sorel's alter ego, the golem to his Smeagol, basically, uh, decided to accept on Sorel's behalf and left his body and now has become the ultimate evil thing. So Sorel is very conflicted. He's also lost his warlock powers, uh, lost his connection to his patrons. So uh, he knows that his patron is being freed and he knows that he's sort of responsible for starting it. So he has had a crisis of character lately and now he's trying to figure out what do I do next? So he is sort of got some things that he wants out of a new, a new line of work, a new profession, a new deity that he is going to pursue. Um, he needs quick and fast training, so he doesn't want to just sit there and try to become a warrior. He wants to go and talk to somebody who can give him powers and abilities, but he wants to make sure this is a good person. He's worked for the bad guys before, didn't like it. He wants to be a good guy. He was ambiguous before. Now he wants to know who his patron, you know, not in the warlock sense, but a patron is, and what they stand for. He also doesn't want to worship one of the gods. He doesn't want to follow or revere one of the gods because they're distant. They're not here. They're not present on this plane. They're far off on the other planes. He's, you know, he kept quoting um, Rocket Raccoon of why do you want to save this plane of existence? Because I'm one of the idiots who lives here. And that was very important to him. He wanted somebody who was one of the idiots who lived here to be somebody he was working with. So we did some research and found out some of who the good deities are and who might be able to give him power. And he found out that there are such things as dragon clerics. These are clerics to usually Tiamat or Bahamut. And they have the ability to, to sort of grant some level of power, but mostly they, they are liaisons to the world for these these gods high level clerics that are also uh, adult or ancient dragons uh it's pretty crazy but uh, he definitely was interested in that and so he went off to pursue uh one of these dragons so it meant he had to take his little tiefling wings and fly to dragon's head isle which is a terrifying location with thousands of dragons living on it and that was very intimidating to him and so he had to get kind of low and try to figure out where is this dragon I'm looking for and uh, it was a really interesting process for him because he had heard from Bahamut hey all right I know what you're after why don't you go to this spot on Dragon's Head Isle and go into this room it's called the the Chamber of Awakening I think I called it and there you will find uh, Avazandum the person you're looking for and Sorrel's like I don't know who that is but okay and he went off and, and had to charter a boat and all these things. It was a little journey to get there. And he went to the Chamber of Awakening and was looking around and didn't really see anyone. And then he heard a noise from out of his bag and he sees uh, this little jar. I don't know if I have explained this to you before, but I am about to. In the first or second session, uh, Sorel was talking to their, their handler, uh, Zelix, the Mind Flayer, and he was, they were just being weird, like, Zelix is a weird dude, and so they were getting some weird items and stuff from him, and, uh, one of the things they got was this little lizard in a jar of liquid, and later on, much later on, Sorel decided to, like, try to talk to this lizard, and he could, and the lizard was this little like headbanger guy who was like, yeah, uh, all the time about stuff. And they loved that guy, it was a fun little mascot, and I, I liked throwing in little quirks of like, 
you know, one time because of a, a random magical happenstance, uh, Sorel got teleported to the Astral Sea for like one round. Um, sort of like a, a mini banishment, but in a different flavor. I forget the context. But uh, when he was there, uh, so the, the lizard was Flash. Flash is his name. And uh, Flash was like, ah, not again. And so I was like, wait a second, you've been to the Astral Sea before? What are you, little lizard? Uh, and so that kept happening when uh, Sorel would interact with Flash. It seemed like he was more than he had let on. And they, they just thought he was a neat mascot who was a weird kind of comical character. And he turns around and he sees this jar with Flash in it sort of rolling like a little hamster ball uh, towards the middle of the Chamber of Awakening. And there's a flash of light and the jar explodes and Sorel looks up and sees this ancient dragon standing over him. Because Sorel had said, hey, I think it'd be really neat if Flash was like this powerful creature or something. It'd be like my patron. That'd be really fun, right? And I had told him, nah, that, that doesn't make any sense. It's just a lizard. Like, don't make it more than it's supposed to be. Like, that'd be weird. Sort of shoehorn it in. Uh, of course, being a good DM, I was like, that is a phenomenal idea. I'm absolutely stealing that. Uh, I had planned on Flash just being uh, nobody. Just being a funny, comic relief kind of uh, sidekick. He wasn't, wasn't even doing anything. He doesn't have any powers. He's just in this jar, and uh, they would ask him questions, and he would just be weird. Uh, and that was fun to play that character. But I could see how much they had an attachment to Flash, and I thought it would work narratively. I could tie it into all the stuff that had been going on, and it would be a cool connection point for Sorel. And so I wrote that into effect afterwards. Don't be afraid to retcon things as a DM to make it more interesting. Don't be afraid to say, wow, I had a one idea, but it's not as cool as this new idea. So if the players haven't seen it one way or another yet, I could just change it, and it's not that big a deal. So if it's retconned in your notes, then it's not actually retconning it's just changing the plan so have a zandam slash flash uh, had this whole conversation with Sorel about how he had been this powerful uh, ancient dragon and his son had become interested in this undead evil named Karshimis. and when Avazandum had confronted his son his son had turned him into a lizard basically and forced him to live out this existence so he's been trapped for I think like, like 800 years or something crazy. Uh, and so he is grateful that Sorel has freed him, but he's also like, all right, I'm on team, kick the crap out of Karshimis and my son, who has become the Draco Lich that your alternate ego is now possessing. Because Mavros, Sorel's golem, uh, is possessing this um, Draco Lich's body, and the Draco Lich's body came from Avazandum's son. I know there's a lot of nouns, there's a lot of back and forth, uh, but basically, Sorel and Flash Avazandum have a connection point. They have a mutual enemy, they have mutual allies, and so they have said, you know what, let's team up together. And Avazandum says, I've been watching you. You have a lot to atone for, but I believe that there is goodness in you. I stole uh, what is very famous to me, but is definitely not a famous line for one of the interactions with this character because Sorel was very uh, beating himself up. He was very upset and sort of frustrated and uh, thinking, you know, woe is me and I don't have in any goodness in me and I have so much to redeem my myself for. And Avazandum, being very wise, said, a man is better than the worst thing he's ever done which I think is quite an awesome line of dialogue and was sort of impactful to Sorel to remind him to sort of pick himself back up and keep going forward. And so Avazandum said, hey, I'm not here to like give you power, but what I will do is I will oversee you awakening this power in yourself. And so I want to oversee you taking an oath that will bind you to this path. And so Sorel did, he swore his oath and he became a paladin. And there were lots of different ways that uh, Walter and I, the player, talked about respecting his character. And I gave him lots of different options because, okay, let's be honest, it would make the most sense if he kept all of his warlock levels but lost most of those abilities and then started multiclassing into paladin. But that'd be weird and he would, wouldn't would have all of his warlock abilities. And so I basically said, you're still a ninth level character. I think they were level nine at the time. Eighth level character, something like that. 
Um, you're still an 8th level character, but you don't have any warlock powers. You don't have any class abilities. You're basically a, an 8th level commoner at this point. You have all your hit points and, and your um, you know ability scores are really high and stuff, but that's pretty much it. You're otherwise a walking commoner. And uh, so this is obviously important to Sorrel to try to figure out how do I become not that? Um, and he wanted to become a paladin. Walter, the player, wanted to become a paladin. And so we had talked back and forth about how that would work and what he wanted to do. And at the end of the day, I just said, look, what would be the most fun for you, Walter? He was like, I don't really want a multi-class. It seems kind of confusing. I want to just be a paladin. I was like, awesome. So we'll take all of your levels of warlock and nuke them, get rid of them, and just give you all of the 8th or ninth level uh, paladin powers. The end. You don't have to go through and progress from first level paladin. That doesn't make any sense. Just go from here and you know there's lots of different ways you could do that mechanically but when you remove a player's class abilities and just like take away their class i think it, it's important to be pretty lenient with the player about what they do next and how that process works even if it doesn't necessarily make sense rules wise just air on the side of the player you've already taken away their whole class so anyways that's how i handled that from there they went together to go and fight um Avazandum's son's mate, and I, I don't remember the son's name at this point. Hang on a second. Aha, the power of notes, Vorzinadrex. So Avazandum has a son named Vorzinadrex, who has a mate named Kofirna. And Kofirna is a special type of dragon, a dragon that has a dragon rider. That is a secret that is kept here in the Dragon Isles, that there are uh, humans that protect the eggs of some of the dragons here and help to rebuild their population after their war with the Grey Elves. And now, occasionally, sometimes, one of those eggs will hatch and bond with a human. And they will become sort of partnered, and the human will be the dragon rider. And it just gives uh, an advantage to both the dragon and the rider in in combat because you have a dragon with you and if for the dragon's sake you have you know a spellcaster or somebody on your back uh, helping you out as well and so Avazandum wants to go and fight Kofirna uh, but Kofirna has a dragon rider who's this evil necromancer dude and says hey Sorel would you help me out uh, with this uh, and so they go together uh, however in the process they do manage to kill the dragon Kofirna but the Kofirna wasn't the problem. The problem was her rider, Velasir, who became a lich in the middle of that combat. So this is Vorzinadrex's body, the Draco Lich, who is being piloted by Mavros. That is Mavros's plan to get his own party together. Sorel has a party, a team of adventurers that are trying to stop Mavros, but Mavros wants to get his own party together. And this is one of the first members, this Lich Velasir. Uh, so things are things are getting spicy now uh, because Mavros has a Lich in his employ and they're going to start uh, freeing Karshimis at an accelerated rate. So after this point, basically Sorel heads back to their castle and the whole group gets together and catches each other up on what they did. You know, it's been a few weeks in game. Uh, and they say, okay, this is what I got up to. I went to the, the hells and I have a cool hammer and we got almost infected by tadpoles and ended up in the plane of limbo. And well, now we have a lich on the enemy team, guys. So it was really interesting them getting to share what had happened in their stories and uh, catch each other up and all that stuff. It was a really neat session. And right after they had finished doing that, there was a knock on the door and this uh, human with these contraptions on his wrist comes in and introduces himself as Daniel. And this is a new character to the group. Group. This is Jason's new character. Now, Jason was playing with the group, um, you know, a few months ago, and he was playing the monk Terrace. Was he a monk? Was he a monk? He was a monk. He was a monk Terrace, and he had died, and so this was an excuse for Jason to sort of step out of the game and focus on some real life stuff. But now, Jason is back to playing with us, and he has made a new character. Uh, his character is a gunslinger uh, in terms of mechanics, but I sort of said, you know, I. I I've done it before, but I don't really like thematically gunslingers in my game. And so would you be interested in trying to do something else like with crossbows, but still using the gunslinger mechanics? So he has these cool like wrist mounted crossbows. Um, and so he just like lifts his, lifts his arm and, and fires them at people and he gets to use the gunslinger rules. And so it was a neat uh, meshing of flavor and mechanics that, to make both the player and I happy because the, uh, you know, 
powder explosive projectile gun wasn't attractive to him, the rules for gunslinger were. And so I was like, neat, let's just use those and reflavor everything that's a firearm as a crossbow. And now uh, the problem is completely solved. And so um, Daniel has an interesting backstory that we sort of worked out together and I wrote up a little bit of a narrative fiction for his backstory. And he has had a lot of interactions with the cult of Karshimis. That was one of the things I told him is, when you make a new character, why would the party accept your character? The party has already got a mission and a goal and here's what it is in case you've forgotten. Why would they want to work with you? Do you have some sort of information or an alignment of goals or anything like that that would cause them to want to team up with you? And so he kept that very focused in mind as he was making this character and he has a huge grudge against the cult of Karshimis and hates them, wants to bring them down. Specifically, one of the head cultists is, um, uh, through his backstory he learned is Nasira Iron. Uh, he also brought a lot of information to the group as a result of his backstory. He told them that uh, the cult of Karshimis is not this tiny little cult on a volcano island somewhere. They have infiltrated many governments at the highest level. This uh, Nasira Iron, this person that I hate and I'm after, one of the main leaders of the cult of Karshimis, is a high councilwoman in the nation of Haven, where we are right now. So the party have a lot of things to talk about, a lot of decisions to make, and they say, you know what, okay, we, we have a mission right now with our original uh, master Ares. Let's solve that first. We've got to try to weaken the country of Renora. And so to do that, we need to find this uh, sanctuary city with all these non-humans living in it, maybe they could muster an army, you know, a couple hundred, maybe a couple thousand people would be able to help us out and make quick work. We also have this evil ritual that requires a lot of crazy ingredients that we don't have, like the hands of a kid or, you know, the, he the, the horn of a fiend, heend of a horn. Horn of the Fiend. Um, and we have all this stuff, but, but we have this evil ritual that will destroy the land and dry up the rivers and all kinds of stuff that would really cripple the country of Renora. Uh, so we need to maybe use that or maybe find sanctuary. But either way, let's go towards that. They had some leads toward finding the city sanctuary and they knew that it was underneath some sort of a dungeon, an ancient cleared out uh, lich's lair. And so they went to the lich's lair and they have to make their way through the whole dungeon. And at the bottom of the dungeon, they would be able to find um, this sanctuary city or a clue that would lead them there. And so I told them ahead of time, there's a lot of different ways to get through the dungeon. Here's a map. Somebody had given you a map of the Lich's Lair. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to get through the dungeon. If you try to clear every room, you'll probably mostly all die. And so just be aware of that. Try to factor in which way are we going and how are we going to travel and all of that. And so, of course, uh, regardless of my warnings... They cleared every room. Uh, a couple times it looked like there would be a TPK. There were three character deaths in the dungeon. They were all resurrected, but there were three character deaths in there. Uh, that was a huge deal. Uh, so I feel a little justified in saying what I said because I was kind of right. They did die a bunch, uh, but they managed to resurrect people and concordance was used and all kinds of stuff happened in that dungeon. Really crazy hack and slash dungeon crawl. They get to the end of the dungeon and they're like, okay, we know something is here. Something has set up in the Lich's absence. You know, there's all this undead has moved in, all these crazy monsters and, and ooze and stuff like that living in this cleared out uh, lair. But what is actually like the boss here? And they walk into this room and it is a beholder. And uh, I have a pretty good kill death ratio with beholders. I have killed seven players now with uh, beholders. I've used them three times, killed seven players and never had a beholder die. So beholders are super lethal, at least in how I run them. And they fought this beholder. Indeed, one player did die. They managed to resurrect him. And midway through the battle, the beholder said, all right, all right, that's enough. I mean, he didn't hold his hands up. Beholders don't have hands. But he said, all right, uh, you can stop now. I am working with the city of Sanctuary. I'm sort of their frontline guard on this end of their entrance. Uh, and I sort of knew some people might be coming through here. And I was told to test you to see if you would be capable and powerful warriors such that you could help out 
the city of sanctuary? Like, why would they trust you if you were evil or weak? And the fact that you cleared out all the undead here shows that you are not evil. And the fact that you have fought me pretty effectively shows that you are not weak. And so I will let you pass. And that was a really interesting moment for them. They got to role play back and forth with, with this beholder and they had a lot of fun doing that. And then the beholder let them pass. All right, so after they interact with this beholder, they make their way down into the city of Sanctuary. They're expecting it to be just like a small refugee city, a couple thousand people maybe, and they find out it's a massive city. It's like 100,000 people here, a thriving metropolis, basically. Uh, it sort of still looks like a refugee camp, but still, it is a large city, and they're sort of encouraged that if they can get these people to help them in this war effort, that would be very effective. And so, um, however, they get off on the wrong foot uh, just because players being players, one of the players gets arrested. Uh, the rest of the players then goes and talks to sort of the council leaders uh, of Sanctuary and tries to negotiate, wrap back and forth. And it's a very interesting time as they're uh, sort of hashing things out and they say, you know what, let's, let's, all right, we need to deal with your friend who's in jail. Uh, why don't you go and, and rest somewhere? Uh, and then, you know, through this process, a couple days it takes to get their friend out of jail and talk things through. And it's a really interesting negotiation. Uh, this is sort of a tip. Uh, I, I won't make a longer video on this, but I, I, I didn't want to gloss over this fact. I think that's really critical. Uh, through most of that dungeon they were running, uh, the Lich's Lair, um, I had players over and over again telling me that was the coolest and most dramatic session that they'd ever had. No, 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 this is the coolest and most dramatic session we've ever had. It was so much fun. And as a DM, sometimes that can be really overwhelming because you're like, how do I top? that? How do I top the best session you've ever played of D&D? Um, what do I do? And my fix for that is not to try to beat the last session on its terms, but to try to create something new and different. And so, you know, the best session they ever had was an uh, epic encounter with this beholder and then a tense negotiation with the council that ended on a cliffhanger. How do I beat that? I do something totally different. And I don't try to try to have you know a big epic combat scenario. I do something totally different. And so the next session started out with them playing a game of siege ball with a bunch of teenagers, just as a fun uh, diversion from everything going on. Uh, just really changed the tone of things, lightened things up, made it more human. Uh, siege ball is something you can Google this. There, I think there are 3.5 rules out there for it. It's a game somebody made, and I've adapted a little bit to fifth edition. Not you don't have to do much to adapt it, but uh, it's a really interesting kind of game, and I've used it a couple times before. It's pretty fun, players like it. Uh, but anyways, don't try to compete with whatever last session was. Try to do something different, change the tone dramatically. If you had a big awesome combat scenario, make a negotiation and then make have a festival and games and exploration, solving puzzles and mysteries, but keep rotating through these so that you don't feel like you have to beat last session on its terms, do something different. So anyways, after that, they have a negotiation, they get their friend out of jail, they have this big back and forth conversation with the council and they use their hologram sending stone to Skype in Ares and he has a whole conversation with them and uh, Ares had some really cool like take it or leave it kind of uh, moments and the players all thought that was a really cool mic drop even though it was just me role playing with myself as the high council person was talking to Ares. Um, the players thought it was really neat to watch that back and forth and, and Ares came in looking all cool in the middle of a battle. He was like, what did you call me for? Stuff's going on. Uh, and he was, he was pretty cool with how he interacted with everything. So the players enjoyed that. And then basically they left it at, okay, um, we will, we, we don't care about helping, about helping you, but we care about hurting Renora because they've been mean to us. So basically we're going to start on the war path, but, um, you know, we're going to try to make sure that we get to eliminate all the human leadership before Ares wins because we, when Ares has a conversation about what does Haven become, we don't want the racist humans to be involved in that because Renora is a very xenophobic, racist, humanocentric uh, kind of country. And so these non-humans have been oppressed by them for so long. They don't want them at the table when they talk about what we do next in Renora. And the players, mostly non-humans, say, yeah, it's fine with me. I don't, I don't care. Um, and so as a result of sort of a good faith effort, um, Sanctuary says, hey, uh, to aid you in your efforts and make sure you stay on the right path, we will give you, uh, you know, one of our most powerful warriors, Ol' Macus. And this Goliath comes out and introduces himself, and I describe this Goliath, and, and then I say, and so the Goliath says, and then I stop. And Charlie starts speaking, and all the players go, wait, wait, what? What, what, what just happened? 
Uh, and so Charlie and I explain, this is Charlie's new character. He sort of feels like Varys has gone through his whole arc. Ger uh, Varys, uh, over his side quest, sort of confronted the person who had burned down his village and, uh, and everything. And they had all back and forth and forgiveness had happened. It was a whole big thing. Uh, but he sort of felt like he had resolved his backstory and he wouldn't want to continue on the warpath. He would want to just settle down and start a tavern and uh, live a quiet life for a while. And so uh, over the process of these, the session and a half or whatever, uh, he started taking on Maccus and he handed over Varys to me. Uh, and so Varys is sort of retiring and now he is fully an NPC under my control. <laughs> Uh, and now he's playing this barbarian, a storm barbarian. Um, and so that's been pretty cool. All right, so they get Sanctuary on their side. They have some fun with some teenagers. And then they have this ritual, which they found out that they interacted with the Lich's ghost in the Lich's lair. And the Lich's ghost uh, offered to give them some information on how to cast that ritual in exchange for letting the Lich possess one of their items. And Daniel was like, sure, go for it. Possess one of my crossbows. And the Lich uh, then did so. And so now he has a Lich in one of his crossbows. And that has been interesting to role play this Lich and goad him onto things and things like that. Um, but yeah, he, so he started explaining, hey, by the way, you know that, uh, that ritual you have? I made it. It's the Lich's ritual. And I know things about it. You don't have to use any of those ingredients. All those ingredients I listed on there, they're bogus. They're not necessary for the casting of that ritual. I just put them on there so that the person who, uh, you know, cast that ritual would do evil things to cast the ritual because I like evil people being more evil. It's just very, like, mustache-twirling bad guy, right? And, uh, you know, cackling laugh. And the players are like, oh, shoot, this just got a lot easier. And so they started uh, preparing to cast the ritual, as they started calling it, the lich's ritual, the ritual. And uh, they went out. And they traveled far away from Sanctuary, and so they started to cast this ritual that was going to destroy the headwaters that fed most of Renora and all this whole thing. And they cast the ritual, but Macus was very much not okay with this. He's like, this is super evil. What you guys are trying to do is super evil, and I'm a good person. I don't want any part of this. And so he opted out of the ritual. And uh, so they cast the ritual. There was a whole thing that had to happen with it. The, the ritual conjured this um, spirit entity and they had to fight it. And the more damage they did to it, the further the explosion radius would be and all kinds of stuff. Uh, so that was pretty neat uh, that they got to do. And they went off from there and they said, okay, we've done this. We've, we've destroyed the land. We've turned the water into sand and uh, everything that has happened. So great. Uh, we have crippled Renora. We've done what we set out to do. Uh, they went and formed Ares, and so the war is going much better now. Pretty soon Renora will fall. They went back to their castle and said, okay, what do we do now? And they had some information about Nasira, this high councilwoman, evil cult of Karshimis type person, and they were like, you know what? Let's go after Nasira. Let's go and get her. And so they they go after her following Daniel, and they go to the city where she lives. Like she, she doesn't live in a in a cackling witch's castle. She lives in the middle of the city. She's a high councilwoman. And so they find it's like this uh, fantasy uh, Tuscany or Milan or Versailles, or it's a really fancy, nice vineyard kind of place. And uh, they talk to uh, some of the, you know, the, the guards there, who turns out these guards are more of like welcome center people, uh, not really military guard type people. Uh, so it was really interesting getting to play, you know, sort of like downplaying or, or um, scorning some of the players' outfits because they're wearing these like travel gear and like, surely you're going to go and get some fancy clothes before you interact with people, right? Uh, so they had to get these nice clothes before they could go around and gather information. So trying to figure out, is Nasira here right now? Because we know she can teleport and stuff. Is she even here right now? Uh, and they think she is. And so they're like, okay. We're like last time Daniel broke in and confronted Nasira, but lost and had to regroup to go find new allies. Well, let's go in the same way he went in. Let's go in through the sewers and try to bust into her secret dungeon lair and uh, capture her there. So the players all follow Daniel in and seems like new security has been installed since last Daniel was here. There's these new, uh, brand new iron gates as, and they have to break through those. And uh, the players were in t uh, incredibly intelligent. They cast detect magic and dispel magic on these gates because they were wired with alarms. and Like the spell alarm, not like... Wee -wee -wee. 
Uh, anyways, and so they had to, they cast a spell magic, but very clever of them. They have been caught before tripping alarms. They uh, learned their lesson, and so they're going in. They had this fight with uh, an Umber Hulk and two Basilisks, which at their at their level is not that difficult of a fight in terms of CR. But when you have to avert your eyes from everything and you have to make these saving throws all the time, and and when you get surprised in the first round, uh, it's bad news. And so it was actually kind of a tough fight. And Azarin got turned to stone as a result of it. However, the players are 10th level now, and so getting turned to stone turns out not that big a deal. And they, uh, you know, have to go get a spell scroll of Greater Restoration real quick and come back down because they got tons of money. And uh, they free um, they free Adara and are able Azarin. Azarin. Adara is her demigod. Um, they free uh, Azarin and are able to get her back unpetrified and say, okay. Let's proceed. And so they bust into Nasira's uh, dungeon lair and they're looking around. It looks like this place has been kind of cleared out. Like last time uh, Daniel was here, there were all kinds of scrolls and books and everything. It seemed like very lived in and now it is mostly empty. It looks like there's still the furniture and stuff here, but there are no books and no information. Um, and the players are sort of talking and debating, what do we do next? Do we go forward from here? Do we retreat and regroup and have a new plan? And they didn't really gather much information. They didn't really ask around much about what's been happening here. Uh, they just sort of went straight forward and uh, it cost them, as you will see in a minute. So as they are debating, Nasira walks into the room. And it seems that she's sort of absentmindedly just sort of walks into the room like she was reading a scroll, steps in, notices the players, the players notice her, and there's sort of this like weird moment as everyone is surprised. And then Nasira runs out of the room and the players all go, that's the person we're after. And they chase after her. And as they round the corner, pass through the door, um, they see Nasira sort of standing there like she had planned this. And they hear a gate close behind them. And these invisible bars uh, appear. Uh, they are no longer invisible. They had been invisible and they closed behind them. They walked right into the middle of a trap. And Nasira describes to them the situation they find themselves in. This is a god blind, an anti-magic god blind. And basically inside here there's this force field or whatever. And not only are the bars projecting an anti-magic field inside so they can't cast any spells. All their items are mundane for now. Uh, they can't fight back basically. Uh, not only that, this is a god blind. Not even the gods can see what's happening here. It's like you've dropped off the map. And that is unfortunate news for the players. They can't use any of their items to teleport away or go to safety. They're pretty well and seriously trapped. And this may seem unreasonable to you, so I feel the need to explain. <laughs> Uh, this is a powerful cultist who had been broken in on by Daniel and tried to tried to be ambushed. And uh, one of the fun things that I did is at the end of this session, uh, Nasira said, "Thank you, Daniel, for bringing these people here." So I sort of left them with the, "Oh, is Daniel uh, Daniel a traitor?" Um, so that'll be an interesting conversation that they have uh, with them, but like the players internally. And so, uh, but the play, the, Nasira has been scrying on Daniel. She has uh, uh, an associated item, and so it's much easier to scry on Daniel. She's been scrying on Daniel. She knows what he's been up to. Uh, that the players, that they've joined together with uh, these players whom uh, Nasira has had interactions with before. Uh, Nasira does not like this group of players and wants to convert them over to her side, the cult of Karshimis' side. And so she's been able to scry on Daniel and watch their progress. And so she has spent the last little while installing this god blind, waiting for the players, baiting them here so that they would come in. And this is stuff that Nick just knows Nasira has been up to. I did not know the players would go after Nasira this quickly. I didn't know how much research they would do. I basically just said, if they run in there without any information or planning, they're probably gonna get trapped. And Nick does not know how they're gonna get out. Uh, as it is, they can't. You know, we've been going back and forth over Messenger talking about uh, how, what can we do and can we do that and is the cage like this and basically all of their um, plans are failing. They have, they're have they not able to do anything because Nasira walked out and two Death Knights walked in and are just kind of sitting there. And so it has been a very interesting back and forth as players trying to figure out how do we get out of this and what are we going to have to give up to get out of this? What does Nasira want? Well, how are we going to have to negotiate and uh, are we going to have to join the bad guys? And what, like, what does that mean? It's gonna, I'm, I'm super looking forward to pulling each player out and interrogating slash negotiating with them one-on-one 
Ultron 1 and sort of trying to convert the heroes to the side of evil. Um, it's going to be super interesting because we have a couple weeks off, so we'll get a break to, to have those conversations. Uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens. But I don't know how they're going to get out. Uh, but I don't feel like that's up to me. I feel like that's sort of up to them. They've already done a couple of things in the last few days to try some stuff that may or may not work. We'll see. Stay tuned. Don't want to give any spoilers. But uh, it has been a really interesting situation. So all this has been going on. And I wanted to catch you fine folks up on what has happened because uh, it's really exciting. Uh, I knew that they were going to run into this trap and uh, it was going to be really interesting, but I don't know what happens next. Uh, and that is one of the fun things for me as a DM is I like to just plan what, what would these NPCs be doing? What are people doing right now? What are they, what are they trying to accomplish? What do they want? Uh, what kind of resources do they have? And then I just put the world in front of my players and say, where do you want to go? What do you want to do? And sometimes the players get in over their head, as has happened right now. Um, and sometimes they find a way to talk themselves out of it or create some kind of crazy plan. And so it's, uh, it's really interesting. So thank you guys for, for following along. This is a very long video. Uh, I'm probably not going to really advertise this on Reddit or whatever, just for the subscribers who want to follow along with this story, who have been already kind of going along with things. It's a lot of confusing back and forth. But uh, this has been a really interesting semester of D&D. And I've had a lot of fun running for these players. They're growing and learning, and they're a lot of fun to interact with. And so it's been going really, really well. A uh, really cool campaign. Th th there's a lot of trust between myself and the players. I know some of you are probably hearing about this, like running into a trap and how, how you know, the actions happened. And wait, wouldn't we have seen something and all this? Uh, but there's a lot of trust between the players and myself. They know that I'm not out to get them, that I'm not like, haha, you've fallen into a trap you couldn't have avoided, and now you will die. Um, they, they know that, um, that they can trust me and that I have their best interests in mind. I am their biggest fan, but I also want really crazy, dramatic things to happen. Uh, and stuff is happening, so I'm kind of right. Um, this is going to be uh, really interesting to see how do you get yourselves out of this mess. And you probably can't get out of here without a cost, but what kind of price are you willing to pay for your freedom? Uh, should be really neat. If you have any cool ideas for what kinds of things you might uh, suggest have happened, uh, please leave them in the comments. Uh, what happens next is very, very cool. And so I have a couple of ideas kind of brewing based on things the players have done and want to do and uh, things like that. No spoilers. But if you have ideas, I am more than open to hearing them. Uh, maybe you have already thought of something that I have thought of. Maybe you have thought of something way cooler than I have, in which case... I won't retcon, I will make a new plan. But anyways, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Wait, I gotta do these videos more often, because this is really long.